Welcome to the Grow with Ryan Magic show. I'm here today with such a special guest, Mark Weber, who is an actor, a writer, a producer, and a conscious creator is the way that I'd summarize you, but also a conscious husband, a conscious parent. And your journey through life has been so incredible today. And I didn't know a lot of your upbringing until I really started like researching into it over the last couple of days and, and seeing what you went through growing up. Uh, you've got a really, really beautiful, incredible story. And you've just been able to navigate through that and bring your heart through to the other side as, as such a, a humble operator in this planet. And I have so much respect and admiration for that. You're a beautiful man and I'm grateful to have you here today. So thanks for being on, man. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you right now. I appreciate that. So there's lots of different kind of directions of questions that I have today, but I'd, I'd love to, to kick off and we'll navigate through your story a little bit more as we go through, but I'd just love to kick off with a, a question around how you found yourself doing your, your life's work. Like you, you, you're a conscious creator at this point, you released a, a film or well, it's still not public, unfortunately, I'm looking forward to the, the place of no words yeah. uh, getting out there so I can actually watch it because it looks incredible. And I've seen, yeah, I've seen little snippets and photos of you getting to bring your, your son into the movie as well. Uh, and yeah. your family into the movie. It, it looks incredible. I'd love to know how, how did you get to this point where you're doing your life's work, your passion and, and then infusing, yeah, your passion into what you do as a, as a movie maker. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a fun question to think about. I think, well, definitely my life when I was younger was really challenging and I was brought into this world by a teenage mom she was 16 when she had me mm -hmm. and the first almost a year of my life we lived in her car and um I was born in Minneapolis Minnesota and I was just born into um extreme poverty and my desire to want to be an actor first came about when I was actually home with my mom as a 10 year old. And it came from a place of, it was a combination of two things. I now know at the time I was looking for some form of external validation to feel whole as a little boy, because I didn't, didn't really fully love myself. I felt ashamed about being poor and the position that I was in. And then it was also too, at the same time, I would go and I would, when I would see a movie, I would totally transport myself. You know, I, I would just kind of forget that I was homeless and I was Superman or I was Indiana Jones or I was one of the kids in Goonies and it just felt amazing. And so there was a bit of also like a coping mechanism happening as well too, an escapism. And then I became fascinated with this idea of becoming a movie star because it felt like at that time, well, if I become famous, rich and famous, I won't be homeless anymore. People will like me and this will remove this shame that I have. And that's where that dream first started. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been a really interesting journey to arriving at this place now where I've taken a look at all the um, unhealthy reasons why I first initially wanted to, to become a performer. And it's been great. I've learned a lot, you know, about who I was then and who I am now as a man and, um, but yeah, it really first just started because it was this idea of like, oh, this will make me feel better, mm. you know, and, and, and people will like me. And it's such beautiful self-awareness yeah. there. Thanks, man. Yeah. And vulnerability. And I do a lot of research into masculine archetypes. My, my journey is parallel as yours in a really different uh, industry, but mm -hmm. very similar drivers. 
and I've done a lot of research into understanding myself and learning to love myself unconditionally as well. And I, in my research around masculine archetypes, I actually found this really unique uh, piece of understanding of young men with this archetype known as the hero. And uh, as a, it's the last masculine archetype to develop in men, if you believe this type of, in, in these archetypes. And the purpose behind developing the hero, which then later in life as a mature man becomes the, the warrior, the hero's role is to give a young man ignorant confidence and, and just this inflated ego to be able to pursue them what they want in life so much so that they separate themselves from the nest. And that's actually like a function of the development of the psychology of men. And I always, when I first started to realize my initial drivers when I was younger, like I wanted to also become some, you know, really wealthy, successful entrepreneur so that I could never end up like my parents ended up and escape that kind of reality that I demonized. And then when I figured out that I was driving from this place of proving myself and, and this place of short-term gratification and needing to achieve to feel worthy of love, when I realized that I also shamed the past. I didn't realize that that was a normal kind of developmental stage of men. And it took a while for me to actually remove the shame of who I was uh, as I started to learn how to be more conscious and actually want to be more conscious in the world. Um, it's, it's a really beautiful story, your, your upbringing. So, so what was it like? Uh, do you remember much of your upbringing when you, is your mom's name, is it Sheree? Uh, Sherry, Sherry. Sherry. Sherry, yeah. what was it like for your mum and you when you were younger? At what age did you start to stabilize more? Um, well, first I want to say that, uh, thanks for sharing that because that really resonated with me and that makes a whole lot of sense. No worries. And it's really interesting thinking about um, how I had to create this overinflated ego. Mm. Um, in a way that wasn't necessarily so bad. It was almost tolerable. It was easy to be around. There was a persuasiveness about my energy that I think people felt good about. Yeah. But it was also corrosive at the same time. Um, but I use interesting. I, I see it. I, I see other men and other women and people who have used their ego in a certain way it's kind of put these blinders on and it works to get certain goals and things achieved yeah but there's an interesting price to pay for that um yeah so yeah but i with my mom it's really interesting in some ways i feel like my mom my mom is so beautiful. She should be dead. I don't know how my mom is alive. I don't know how she has survived mm. through the abuse and the pain and the suffering that she was subjected to. You know, my mom first left, ran away from home because she was the victim of sexual abuse from her stepfather. Um, her older brother killed himself because of the abuse. So it was an extremely traumatic household and she met my father in a halfway house and he was a heroin junkie who was like 15 years older so you talk about all the ingredients to create someone who for all intents and purposes should have just turned into a total drug addict themselves or killed themselves or you know was like fuck the world i hate everybody it had this miraculous opposite effect on my mother um she became more compassionate and i think because she was so young when she had me there was this brother sister relationship there was there it was it was her youthful energy served us in our circumstance in a way um and i don't think she knew it at the time but she was instilling in me as a little homeless boy the 
the way to manifest, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, she was, she always told me, you can make anything happen. You know, you, there is nothing that you can't do in life. And so when I had, you know, developed this dream of wanting to become an actor as a homeless kid, Mm -hmm. uh, she never made me feel like that was impossible. She only ever made me feel like that was of course possible. So in so many ways, my mom was always a stabilizing force. So there was a lot of fear that came up. There was a lot of shame and a lot of hard circumstances, but I always felt seen and heard and loved by my mom. Mm. Um, That's so special. Yeah, it reminds me of of one of my favorite movies. It's a beautiful life, or life is beautiful with the Nazi concentration camp. Oh yeah, yeah. With uh, Benin, what's his name? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Benin. Yeah, and the way that he is able to parent through the Nazi concentration camp sounds a little bit like how your mom parented you. Yeah, it was. I just, I, I still find myself, even right now in this moment, like I can tap into this thing. I just get these intense waves of gratitude yeah, I can feel for it. my mom because it's like, I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah. I don't know how she did it. Um, yeah. I operate under the belief and I'm not sure if you do the same, but I operate under the belief that our souls choose a specific life in order to take us to a point where we can then fulfill our life's mission. And it sounds like your mum's soul chose a journey that was going to force her to build so much resilience, so much strength, yeah. so much power that she can then use for good. Cause right now she's a, an advocate for the homeless and a humanitarian and, does yeah. this all this incredible stuff right she does and it's funny though you know the thing about my mom it's really hard for her to practice self care she mm-hmm. almost like had to cultivate so much resilience and and survive that she went to one extreme that it's it's almost impossible to get my mom to take a nap her phone down to not worry about other people and to just look after herself. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> it's, it, it's kind of like my new challenge and mission as her son later on in life to, to get her to look after herself a bit more. Um, mm-hmm. She's just, she's selfless to the point of, uh, uh, to a point I've never really, before and and in some ways i don't you know and that's okay i I think maybe that's just how she's going to be forever and and that's it's lovely yeah well she would get a lot of her needs met through the work that she does as well but it'd just Mm -hmm. be physically hard if she's not caring for herself i'm i'm very true i'm really curious to know from your perspective because you're you're a you're a famous actor a hollywood actor Mm -hmm. And yeah. now I would say you're more of a conscious, a conscious movie creator, spreading these beautiful messages through the movies and projects that you choose to spend time on. Uh, I'm, I, but I'm actually really curious about the way that you parent. And I'm curious about the way that, because I've, I've, I've watched you online. I, I know how devoted you are as a, as a father and how much love you want to instill in your kids. And I heard you speak about that briefly at uh, the GQ gentleman's ball that where I met you in Melbourne. And it's a topic that I'm very fascinated with considering. So I had a bit of an interesting parenting dynamic growing up as well. And I'd really love to learn from what you've learned so far and the kind of principles that you choose to parent your kids with. So tell us about what's your philosophy around being a conscious parent. The best thing that I learned early on was children are not you they're their own person you know they're not an extension of you they're not your pet (laughs) they're not your object uh they're their own person and 
being able to make that, have that realization early on in my parenting journey really served me because I have a tendency to want to fix everything all the time, make everybody feel okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and having children, it's really interesting. Whatever age they arrive at often triggers that same time period for you. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was a, you know, a child, so when my oldest son just turned 12, um, it brings up that 12 year old little boy in myself. And so it can get confusing sometimes you to, to draw the proper distinctions between what's your stuff, your emotional pain um, versus their own and uh, learning how to not, to, to have the awareness of when you're projecting your own children and be able to, to pause and stop that is really helpful. Wow. Um, That's next level. Cause a lot of people don't have awareness of what projecting is, let alone be able to consistently be checking in and going, hang on a second. Am I projecting my own frustration and control into my child here? That's next level. It's and it's thank you. It's been everything for me. It's so helpful because it's interesting too. You know, when you have children, it's the first time you really experience unconditional love. And it's beautiful. And I didn't realize that. Um, before my first son was born, I thought my life was going to be over. You know, I was like, oh my God, how am I going to, how am I going to keep making movies? How am I going to take care of him? How am I going to do all these things that I wanted to do? I didn't think I was going to be a dad this young. Um, and I was so worried and so afraid. And then my son was born and it was, Oh my God, what's this feeling? And it was like, I, it's, it saved my life because I experienced unconditional love and I realized, oh, this is what I need right now in my life to not just be living for myself. I now need to live for another person and look after them. And that was really awesome. And you know, the, the first few years of becoming a dad, um, I had to learn really quickly uh, how to be able to distinguish my own stuff versus uh, my little ones. And that can be really hard when they're first born, right? Because they're just entering the world and they're, they're innocent little beings and they learn, you know, and you're putting them in the experience is to start to develop uh, parts of their personality, but they come into this world with a soul, you know, and it's uniquely their own. And there are little simple ways that you can tap into your, your one hour year old little child's essence um and a, and a lot of the times that's just simply by slowing down mm. a little bit you know uh there's such a tendency for parents we always have some place we got to go and the kids got to get ready cuz we got to take you to the place and kids really react strongly to that you know um the same way i i tell my my adult friends all the time my my parent friends how would you react if someone just barged in the room and was like, okay, get dressed. We got to go right now. You know? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's like also two little things like, um, you know, parents wonder why kids hate getting their nose wiped. Well, it's because generally for the, for the most part, parents just grab a tissue and they come right in there and they just start rubbing their face. And that's a great little example of showing people, wait a second, that's a person. And imagine if someone came up to you and just started wiping your face without Mm. looking at you and acknowledging you and saying, hey, 
I see your nose is running. Can I wipe your nose? You know, and it changes things. It changes. Um, it, it just really strengthens uh, this notion that, yes, I, you are my child. I'm here to care for you, but you also are your own person. And I need to give you that mutual respect, even when you're defenseless and innocent, because it can be confusing because when they're so innocent and they need you so much, it can drive home this idea that they're just yours, mm. you know, like you own them in a way yeah. and you don't, you don't. Mm, that's such you a know. powerful notion. I've never heard of that before. I've never really thought about that before. Even though I've realized, even with my fur babies, I've got two dogs. I notice my like <laughs> inherent, like subconscious desire to control them when I feel like they're not acting the way I want them to act or the way that I would act. And they're just dogs, let alone having babies, humans that I'm raising. That's such a powerful idea. So have you noticed times do you notice the way that your kids react differently when you're treating them more as an, as a person versus? Oh, 100%. And it, it starts so young. And so this is the best piece of advice I can give to any new parents is perfect example. Also is when you go to change their diaper, right? We can just get into this uh, pattern of you pick them up, you put them down, you just try to pull their nappy off, their diaper off, and just start wiping them and changing them. And devoid of any connection or respect. And, I, and, and it can seem silly, right? Because people think, oh, they're just a kid and their diaper needs to be changed. Why do I need to check in with them about that? But I see, and I experienced it to myself, and I've, I've seen with other parents have problems with getting their kids to stay still to change their diapers or they start crying or they don't want their diaper changed and for the most part that's simply because they're coming in there they're picking them up they're putting them down and they're not taking the moment to connect with them and almost uh ask for simple permission you know and and slow down and give that respect yes. and I, I see it. I've felt it. I experience it with all my little ones. When I do that, they soften. They allow me to change them. They don't want to pull away. They don't want to roll off the change table. And it's powerful because it's, it's, it's a reminder also of how you want to be treated, you know, uh, as an adult. You know, the, yeah. the, the, we all, it, it's, you got to give your children that mutual respect from, from the moment they enter this world. Mm -hmm. And it's made my journey with parenting so much easier in so many ways, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen the way that it has made my children more confident and self-assured um in ways that i i you know maybe wasn't so much you know mm. a, 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 as a little one and it's it's a really beautiful thing you know yeah that's next level do you homeschool your kids yeah so we go through periods where we do so when we're all here in america um bodhi and forest are uh, because our lives get tricky with the travel and living in two different countries yeah. um but in uh when we're home in australia they have a school there's two different schools that they go to so mm -hmm. bodhi goes to a school and forrest goes to a montessori school mm -hmm. and then um my older son isaac goes to a, a really great school out here in los angeles um so we do a bit of both you know yeah. And, and so when this, this, uh, you know, pandemic started, it was, it was a bit, um, easier at first for us to kind of transition into doing school at home all the time, because we've been used to that. Yeah. This whole theme around taking that extra time is a beautiful theme. 
And I think a metaphor, it's very similar to meditation. A lot of people don't feel like they have the time or the space to meditate. But then when you create that space, you actually get more done and can be more productive and things happen smoother. It's kind of like taking that extra time to connect with your little one. You're going to get less resistance. You're actually going to get more of what you want if you take that time. Sounds very, very similar. But when you're in that kind of erratic reactiveness, because you're feeling disconnected from yourself, it's very hard to, to switch it. And this, this already for me, I, I consider myself to be someone that's very interested in being conscious and very fascinated with it and have a devoted meditation practice. And listening to the way that you spoke about raising your little ones and connecting with them and giving them respect and the fact that they're their own humans, that's really game changing. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. It's next level. Thanks, man. Thank cool. you. Yeah. 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 So, uh, what are some, do you do any consistent proactive, uh, practices or rituals or stuff with your kids in, in terms of instilling confidence, self-love, self-worth with them? Yeah. All, so, yeah, yeah, we do. We, um, well, the big thing that we always really encourage is a lot of self play mm. time, um, for extended periods of time, uh, where we allow them to go and do what they want to do, mm. um, and, and give them the space and, um, often let them have little mini struggles, right? Uh, that's another key thing is that, um, for instance, what's a good example. So as opposed to bringing out a bunch of toys, right. And saying here, Forrest, here, Bodhi, here's this toy play, use it. It works like this. And this is how you do this. And now you can go do this thing. We present them with options and we lay them out. And then we let them choose. Um, so that's a big that's a big thing for us. And that um, that's actually a bit of a, a methodology called ride parenting, where you learn a little bit more of a hands off approach and how that benefits you. You allow you kind of you allow your children to uh, struggle a bit, you know, and not come in and try to fix it right away or show them this is the way you climb up the stairs or this is how you get on the thing you let them figure it out for themselves you know you step in to keep them safe when it makes sense mm -hmm. but it's important to allow them to um, struggle a bit and to work through it uh, that was another big thing for me too, because when my first son was born, I had a tendency to be a little bit of a helicopter parent, you know, where I'd hover around all the time, like, Ooh, careful. Ooh, don't, ah, you're going to get hurt. Um, yeah. but, and so allowing them free time and then we do meditations together, wow. um, That's which cool. is a, yeah, it's really awesome. Um, and breathing is a really big one. That's the way. Uh, we do little check-ins, you know, with each other too. And I'll even have Bodhi and Isaac will remind me sometimes like, dad, are you breathing? <laughs> you, take a, you know, you take a deep breath. So when you're being triggered, imagine that you're being triggered I, by your kids and then they say, are you checking in when you're breathing? I, I know. It's amazing because it's amazing. Like, I can't tell you how many times that's happened and I've been like, Oh God, you know what? You're totally right. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, um, and it's the one thing little kids don't want to do when they're really pissed off. It's, it's a, you got to learn the right way to get in there and do it. But if you do it enough, it becomes easier and to get to cut, to cut through and, and, get them to take a breath, mm. you know? Um, and boy, when your kid's having a tantrum, if you can figure out how to get in there, if they can just get <gasps> one in, in the, in between the, <gasps> you know, tears and all that stuff, mm. it immediately starts to calm the central nervous system. And wow. then you can try, your kids can get back online into their, you know, prefrontal cortex and, and you can start to, 
reasoning starts to come back in, you know, mm. and, and they can settle. Um, so yeah, the things that we do as adults, we try to create, um, the same things for them. And so, um, meditating, breathing and play and exercise, you know, Amazing. Key. such powerful foundations that most people miss and then look for the hacks and the yeah. hacks aren't going to plug them. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, have you seen the movie? This is my favorite movie, by the way, Captain Fantastic. Oh, is that with Victor? Viggo Morton? Yeah. Viggo Viggo Morton. Morton. I did. Oh boy. Yeah. That it's, was an incredible film. Oh, I love that movie. It, it, it was for me because of the parenting element to it. Uh, it was actually my favorite movie. I saw it twice in the cinema and I've probably seen it another five times since then. And also oh, the, that movie really got me. Yeah. That yeah. got me. It's beautiful. Wow, I haven't thought about that movie since I saw it. You know, that was a very powerful film. Hopefully one day we get to watch it together. I'm definitely going to rewatch oh, yeah. it many times. <laughs> There was so many things about it. I remember when it first came out, friends would text me and were messing with me like, oh, they made, there's a, you're in a movie, about, there's your family, you know, it was, it, you know. That's what um, I was thinking. And there was elements of that that made me feel like, yeah. oh yeah, totally. I see, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. What is, what is your favorite movie and, and why? It's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. One with um, Gene Wilder. I, it just got me. It just got me. Tell us about and it. And it, it's a movie that I've seen a gajillion times. And I think I clearly saw parts of myself in Charlie, like mm -hmm. uh, a poor boy who, uh, you know, is wanting to, to get the factory, you know, to get the dream, to have the thing happen. Um, and it was the perfect... Uh, elements of like fantasy meets uh, an element of reality that resonated with me in my own life of being poor. Um, and then Gene Wilder, his performance just really fascinated me. Um, the Oompa Loompas. <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it, it got me, man. It totally, it totally got me. Um, and it's a movie that I, I, come back to and when I first showed my kids it was like the best feeling in the world and yeah. I think it's you know taps into that thing of like oh my god everything's candy like you can eat the the table and you know and um it just awakens this like fun creative uh fantasy element that I love so much yeah yeah Beautiful. And it, and it really is a, a film of possibility as well. And that sounds yeah. similar to what you're saying about your mom, like allowing you to realize that any, everything's always possible and it can happen. And it's just another beautiful example. I haven't thought about that movie for a long time either. So the same <laughs> way that mentioning Captain Fantastic kind of sparked your memory. Same thing with me. Uh -huh. I, watched it, I watched Willy Wonka so many times as a kid. So good. Yeah. yeah. So do you have any new uh, movie ideas that you're planning on birthing next after the place of no words comes out? Yeah, I do. And so the one I've been working on it for the last year and a half, I've been writing it and it's in that like super sacred spot right now where I like can't talk about it, but I want to so bad. Well, tell us about the place of no words. Cause I'm really looking forward to, to hearing it, to watching it. And oh yeah, all I the can't message. Wait. Yeah, When's it coming out? What's the story here? <laughs> so yeah, we just right now we're this is cool. This is the first time that I'm publicly sharing this is that we have a really great distribution deal and it's coming out in theaters in October and in the US first. Yeah. And then it's I know it's the whole <laughs> like everything honestly should just be worldwide at this yeah. point that I, I think eventually that model it's going to just transition to that fully yeah. um but the fact that we have a theatrical release here in the states right now on the table is a really great thing considering this crazy time period that we've been in um yeah. congratulations so it, thanks man thank you so yeah. much i'm really i'm i'm really so excited for um 
it to get out to a mass audience. I spent the last year touring it uh, at these various film festivals and it's been just like a, an amazing experience because um, the, the, the type of films that I make, they just, they hit different in a different way. They're, they really open people up. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm holding people in my arms, mm. crying after some of these screenings. And it's a, such a beautiful wow. exchange of energy. And it's, it's, the, it's the sole reason why I make films and I'm a storyteller at this, at this stage in my life. It's like I only, my mission of making films is I, I just want people to feel not alone. Mm -hmm. And I want people to, to connect and realize how we're all connected. Mm -hmm. And all the films I make, even though they're, they're different, the one central theme of them all is to, to, to unlock that, that feeling of connectedness, you know, that, mm. of, of all things. Um, and so it's really, it's beautiful. I've had just a year of sitting with people um, and talking with them about uh, what it, it unlocked in them and ways wow. that they relate um, from people all over the world. And that's one of the greatest gifts of being able to be an artist and a storyteller in that way and, and to, yeah. to make films, you know, that exchange is so deeply fulfilling. Yeah. Well, you're an artist, but you're a connected artist. A lot of artists feel yeah. so separate and don't bridge that connection of realizing that they're the same. So you're a very unique man in that case, because yeah, a lot of people, and that's what makes artists brilliant is they're kind of like unique, feeling an express expression creative expression but they i, I know from un understanding the archetypal and personality traits of an artist that they often feel separate from the world and you actually have learned to feel connected to the world and that's what a brilliant and and as a result because most artists won't get or allow themselves to feel the receiving from their giving into their art and it sounds like that's what you've done over the last year yeah i it's been vital i've needed that that was the that was the um the big missing component to really unlock real joy you know yeah. um because there was a period of time when i first started making films just as an actor where initially it was like oh wow my dreams have come true this is amazing but after about four or five movies I had this like, uh, uh, I don't feel so great though, you know, ah, this isn't my end all be all. Wait a second. It, my, it, it's happened. Why don't I feel whole? Why don't I actually feel good? Mm -hmm. Why do I have more anxiety? What's going on? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so much of my journey as a, as a director as well has been kind of healing the initial pain that started to happen from first just making films in a way where I was still doing it for uh, external validation. And yes. when it flipped for me to just be a real pure exchange of energy mm -hmm. that had a purity of intention behind it, which is simply just love, you yeah. know, uh, it was a game changer for me, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and also too, it was great. When I first started becoming a director, it really um, helped remind me how much making films is being of service. You know, you work with a lot of different people. Um, and so now when I show up uh, on films that I just act in, now that I have the experience of being a producer and a writer and a director, I have so much, I have a deeper understanding of, of the group effort that is required to make a film and i show up and i i just i want to be of service as well because i think when you're a lot of young actors and actors can have the the tendency to think that everything's just about them you know that everybody's there just for them and that's where this weird twisted notion of being a star gets really inflated and 
mm. uh, um, corrosive. Yes. Uh, and so now I get to show up and feel like, oh, I'm being a service, you know? Um, yeah. How can I make everybody's jobs easier, you know? Yeah. And it's been great. I could really relate to that from being a, like a business owner and an entrepreneur and a CEO. Yeah. And then I can see the kind of entitlement that comes in with most people that it just comes from ignorance as employees when they come in and they're like, I do this, I get this. And there's a disconnect because they don't understand the full picture. And it sounds like a very direct ex overlap similarity from understanding the behind the scenes, the works, what's actually happening with the full scope of a movie and then being able to have a greater appreciation for, for the whole spectrum as an actor. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's key. It's key. Yeah. Cool. So one, and this is kind of the last thing that I wanted to touch on for, for today, but I'm sure we'll have many more chats. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you uh, have a beautiful nature. You've got a very loving heart. You wear it on your sleeve. That's really obvious. And you, you've been able to take that love and those beautiful intentions and with those intentions, mm -hmm. grab them and then make something with them. So you actually have a, a very strong warrior energy to you that you like you still have a, a a big strength to you where you pursue what you want you're fierce in your beliefs i'd love for you to talk to your perspective or experience with honing the strength of and the importance of of of, of real strength in carrying out your mission because you're living your mission you're living your and i know as someone who's kind of been able to achieve what i thought my dream life was and then disconnect from self-love and fulfillment, that whole thing as well, that, yep, we still just feel like a person doing our thing, but you, but you really are living your dream life. You really have actualized that, uh, and that's really special. So I'd love for you to speak to the importance of carrying your strength and what you do to foster, like, is it courage? Are you nervous? Like, you pursued the place of no words. That's a big deal to go after your whole own film. I'm sure you had to do lots to be able to make that happen. Yeah, I'd love for you to talk about the importance of strength uh, and balancing that with love, or does it come from love? Yeah. Well, first of all, it feels so good to hear you frame m my life in that way as being someone who's living out a dream mm -hmm. um so thanks man you know like that feels really really good and nice. it's encouraging you know and this whole exchange and having this opportunity to talk with you in this way is so encouraging mm -hmm. and i think we all need encouragement in life no matter where you end up or whatever perceived position that you're at, we all still need encouragement and acknowledgement. Um, so thanks. And I think for me, like vulnerability is, is, is key. You know, authenticity is key. Uh, I, it, it, it's kept me alive. Um, I really do believe that comparison is one of the greatest forms of, of self violence, of mm. self harm. It's like self mutilation in a way, you know, um, the comparison because it, 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 uh, drives home the illusion that that we're actually separate from one another um and i don't think that's the case um and i have gravitated towards people in my life who just really are themselves and feel like themselves mm -hmm. um and aren't afraid to say how they really feel aren't afraid to look silly or stupid or contradict themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I love people like that. I, I, I say this thing that I, 
this this metaphor almost in a way of like a lot of when you go into a party and there's a bunch of people kind of standing around and looking at each other and not really sure what to do i i always love that person who just comes in and is just totally themselves and it almost gives permission for everybody else to be like oh wait a second what am i doing uh i don't need to act any other way or you know try to be cool or try to be interesting i just need to be here and be in this moment um and be free of fear of being judged uh and so those things have all really served me so much in going and pursuing uh the things that i've wanted to get accomplished in my life and for cultivating strength i find so much strength in being vulnerable mm-hmm. and uh that's synonymous with being authentic to me um and truthful and honest mm. um and i find myself the more that i do that and the more that i'm in that way everybody else is mm. and it cuts out a lot of um the posturing and posing that people can want to initially do in trying to develop something or work on something or creating a partnership it like saves a lot of time you know um you become more efficient in a way because you don't have to waste a bunch of time you know trying to figure out well if i it, i should act like this because if i'm like this then i'll get this and then it'll happen like this no it it just just be you yeah. be here be right here right now and um I think that that has given me a lot of strength. Um and helps me not get into a state of comparison or or fear and because right behind those two elements is doubt. And once you know you're in that state as a a human being, you it's it has a paralyzing effect. Mm. You know, and you don't uh it, you don't get things accomplished you know and and so um i've been able to to stay in this state of presence um pretty consistently now you know um for quite some time and the more that i'm doing that uh the better i feel the more relaxed i am and i'm to stay in these great states of of flowing you know what mm-hmm. people call like the flow and uh and then it's it, that strength to me um mm-hmm. and yeah so that that's it that's beautiful that's so beautiful and it's uh as you were saying that it was really inspiring for me because what you made me realize is that all the people that we look up to and admire most around the world, like really admire are those that are the most authentically outrageously themselves. Like totally. Lady Gaga, like Oprah, like even people that may still have a lot of strong ego, people like Conor McGregor, people like the fact that he, even if he hasn't created this oneness feel, he's still outrageously being what his authentic self at that stage of consciousness. And people yes, can it's on to that. It, that's that's it that's exactly it and the reason why we feel drawn to that is because it's a reminder of the only way we should ever be you know yeah. um is just unabashedly ourselves you yeah. know um free of fear of 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 judgment of how people are going to perceive us it it's um yeah i know all those people that that feel like they are just really being who they are and are comfortable in their own skin is everything you know yeah. for me because there's, yeah yeah there's obviously like a i just i'd love to dig a tiny bit deeper on this before we wrap up there's obviously an an integration mm-hmm. phase of going from feeling like you're being judged and you can't be be yourself to radical authentic self authenticity because 
you spoke about the importance importance of people feeling encouraged when people first start being different it's normal it, it, unfortunately it is normal that people at that party if 10 guys are mm-hmm. standing around with a beer in their hand and they're talking and then one person goes and starts dancing outrageously like themselves the other guys are most likely going to be like oh you look like an idiot or you know point their finger but if he kept doing it they would have no choice but to join and Mm -hmm. so there's that that tension that that tension of being uncomfortable in your own authenticity before it normalizes and i'm sure Mm -hmm. you experienced that as well could you talk to that and and how you because you said now it's quite normal for you to be present and authentic but how did it become normal obviously by practicing a bit yeah well by by what you just said is that um being in those moments and continuing to just push through of doubling down on it knowing that oh yep so those guys might be laughing at me right now um and reminding myself though probably the reason is is because they actually identify with that that's what they want to be doing themselves you know it's the same way that you know like people who bully people or 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 make people feel bad or or try to make people feel bad about themselves or feel like they're crazy or or less than we know that that comes from a lack of self-love and self-esteem and self-worth you know Mm. it's it's not it's never about the other person it's always about yourself you know and this is a deep fundamental truth and so um knowing that okay people have the tendency to judge because they're actually really just afraid you know yeah um and they are just at a place in their journey where they're still learning how to push through that fear you know Mm. and that's a okay and i and to have compassion for that and acceptance for that and you just kind of wrap that all up within the moment you know that knowing Mm. um and and it can help guide you through those moments where um oh yep i'm just gonna keep dancing (laughs) (laughs) you know it, it allows you to just keep dancing and just being you and and really going for it right um so yeah look i think everybody just wants to be loved and to give love i mean i think that that i I think life simply boils down to that at the end of the day and Uh, you know far away from that sometimes and um we just uh we can remind each other that that is the way simply by just by being yourself even more now um Mm. yeah beautiful man what a beautiful last little theme to to talk about on today's chat before we wrap up i want to give people the chance to figure out where's best to to follow your journey and see what films you're bringing out next and be able to connect with that. Um, but I also want to just honor you, man. I want to say thanks for coming on, but more importantly, thank you for being such an amazing role model in this world as a husband. And I know we didn't talk about too much about you and Teresa today, but I'd love to explore that more in the future, but you as a husband, as a conscious father, as a conscious creator, and as someone that just cares about people, has such beautiful compassion and empathy and is walking around feeling inclusive in this world. It's a beautiful thing, man. And I love today's conversation. I had such a great time discussing these points. This is why I do what I do for conversations like this. So thank you so much, man. Where? Thank you. No worries. Where is best for people to check you out and follow, follow you along on the journey? Which platform are you most active on? I think Instagram is the best place. Um, just, I'm just Mark Weber on Instagram. I think um, that's where I connect with so many people, so many yeah. people. 
um, and I, I share parts of my life and my thoughts and my feelings and the work that I'm doing and um, have had family so as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've had so many amazing interactions with people there and connections there. Um, yeah. And Teresa's totally got to talk to you. You got to have Teresa on as well. Too. I would love that, to have Teresa on. You know, um, because I, I think she would love being able to, to share um, with you like her, her journey and um, amazing yeah man and i just look forward to hanging out you know Same. More. i can't wait to actually <laughs> like, meet you meet you guys and connect with the family and before yeah, er, earlier on this uh chat you spoke about the importance of encouragement i actually got a, the most random email last night that was so beautiful i put out a job ad for a personal assistant on yeah. seek seek and i had someone send me an email saying that they it was a really long email saying that they weren't right for it, but they loved the way that I'd written the job ad. And it was someone that was, I'm not experienced for the position, but I just wanted to say that the way that you wrote the job ad gave me lots of encouragement, made me oh, feel re-inspired awesome. to find a job. And that made me feel encouraged about my search for my PA. And then- That's amazing, man. I know, right? And then a few hours after that, an applicant popped in who was amazing. I was, wasn't feeling mega awesome about it. I was like, what? Because I put some funny things in the job ad, like the examples of things that you'd have to do for, or like doing your role. And it was like submitting bass, doing monthly reports and fetching Ryan a sandwich. I finished off with fetching Ryan a sandwich. <laughs> so I was trying to make it fun, but real as well. Yeah. And so it was, that was just, that made me feel encouraged but it was by someone that didn't feel qualified for the position. It wasn't going for the position that just said something random and nice. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because anyone that's listened to this, it means the world for everyone to feel encouraged. And if you can go and follow Mark Weber at Mark Weber on Instagram and send a message of any part of this that connected most with you, it always means the absolute world. And I'm not sure whether I'm sure that you've got, ton of people that are messaging you you're obviously a, a hollywood actor producer writer director you've got a lot and you've got a full family uh but it just means the world to be able to read through those those messages so please uh, i i know that it mean the world for mark for to send something like that through it's so true it, it it always does and it never stops feeling great and i i try to respond and connect with everyone in that way to and I also encourage people who are trying to get the arts or um, get into the industry in some way, please reach out. That's, that's an appropriate thing to do. Slide into the DMs, shoot your shot, take a chance. You know, that's Love the way that. you do it. It's really important, you know, and, and uh, don't need to follow some particular preconceived idea of an etiquette to have, you know, um, yeah. just be yourself. Do, do what moves you, you know? That's a really nice, really beautiful gesture. Well, thank you again, mate. Thank you so much for jumping on. Loved it and look forward to chatting yeah, with you too. again soon. All right, bro. Cool, man. That's where the it'll cut. That was awesome. Okay. I love that. That yeah, was man, so much too. fun. It's so good. So good, man. <laughs> really appreciate you spending the time, man. I'm so glad that we got to connect more today. Yeah, so me much. too, man. So much synergy and overlap of values. I, I love the way that you parent. I love what you were saying about parenting and, and treating the child like an individual. That's going to be a stretch for me. That's going to trigger me big time. To and I know it's so hard. It's yeah. it's so hard, but it it literally is everything. Do you are you you want do you want to have kids? You want to have kids? Yeah, absolutely. Not straight yeah, away, yeah, yeah, but yeah. absolutely. But yeah. I guess I'm not going to be the yeah. judge of when it happens, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It, it's the, it's kind of like, the, it's like the best thing, man. You know, <laughs> it becomes like your greatest work. Yeah. You know, your greatest does and you, it, it just, uh, you heal and grow at just a tremendous rate if you allow it to happen. It, it just accelerates all the work that you're already doing in so many ways. Um, and, you know, of course, Teresa wanted to have babies too. And so it doesn't hurt having a 
everyone have kids um but we sh it's we share for the same reason it's just because it's like we see what happens that that has children and it's like the best thing you know yeah yeah well i'm, I'm you're gonna be I, an awesome dad dude thanks man i really appreciate that and i feel like i will too i feel like i've kind of that's part of my purpose as well because having a i haven't told you much about my upbringing but i had a drug abusive family drug dealer dad alcoholic mom and kind of grew up and in this turbulent kind of house and same with my sister all these things are i was just a sensitive shy little kind of mama's boy as well i yeah. can really feel that that's how, why we connect so much because we both have yeah. such big nurturing kind of that's our our most authentic selves mm -hmm. and i put on some strong kind of mask all the time but i'm, I'm trying like learning to in <laughs> yeah. in integrate it you know what i mean uh -huh integrate the strength uh -huh. through the love yep. do you do you do you yep. follow justin baldoni or no should just, i Who? man i think you'd love justin baldoni he's the um he's a director and um, movie producer and he made the movie six feet apart okay i feel like this will be the start of like a really powerful uh relationship that i'm suggesting with for you too oh wow I just wrote his name down. Okay. Yeah. Justin Baldoni. I, he's like a, he's a movie producer and an actor yeah. who is, yeah. I've connected more and I know more about you than I know about him, but I actually heard about him through listening to the Jay Shetty podcast and he made a movie called six feet apart. And his goal is to make movies that make people feel and he's someone oh, that like cool. only takes on projects that are really connected to like consciousness and heart as yeah. well. I just feel like you'd really like him. I thought you might've already been friends with him. Um, oh, cool. All right. Well, I, now I will be. <laughs> yeah. And that works. I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Awesome, cool, man. man. Well, thanks again for the time today, man. I'm really looking forward yep. to connecting more and I can't wait to meet, see you again and give you a big hug and get to know the family and, I know, yeah. man. We're gonna be we're gonna be in Australia for um, all the way through the end of July. So we'll find each other. It'd be cool to see you. You know, in awesome, that man. in that time time frame. You know. Okay. Cool. All really right, loving bro. it. All right. Thanks Have again. Have a great for your rest of your today, day. Man. Of course. <laughs> you too, bro. Thank you. Okay. Good man. Love. See you, man. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.